Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. To cook. To cook. I'm going to cook dinner tonight. To cook is to prepare a meal using heat. Tonight I'm going to cook chicken marsala. I'm going to cook beef stew. To fry. To fry. I don't want to fry the chicken because it's too unhealthy. To fry something is to cook something in hot fat or oil. French fries are fried. And fried things are unhealthy, so when you eat fried foods, you want to eat in moderation. I don't, because fried stuff is delicious, but you should. To add. To add. Before you eat, you should taste the food and add salt if necessary. To add in this context means to add something else onto a dish, to put more of something onto a dish. So you might add salt to a dish, or add some paprika to the chicken. To cut. To cut. Could you please cut up that beef? To cut is to use a knife to cut food, to make it into smaller pieces, usually so you can bite it or so you can mix it more easily. I cut my steak so I can eat it. You make food smaller into more bite-sized pieces by cutting. To mix. To mix. Mix all of the spices in a bowl before putting them in your dish. To mix is to combine. So you might combine or mix all of your ingredients together before cooking or doing something else with them. You might mix ingredients together to create a dish. Breastfeed. All right, the first word is breastfeed. Breastfeed means uh, feeding a baby using the milk from the mother. So there's like baby formula, which you can give to babies, um, or there's just natural milk, the mother's milk, which is breast milk, uh, or but the verb that we use is to breastfeed a baby. So in a sentence, uh, many mothers choose to breastfeed their children. In this sentence, you're not supposed to drink alcohol while breastfeeding. Change a diaper. The next expression is change a diaper. Change a diaper. So diapers are the um, pieces of cloth or like the disposable things that babies wear because uh, babies, of course, don't have the ability to use the bathroom like a grown a uh, human or like even like children can. So uh, babies need diapers. So to change a diaper means uh, to take off a used diaper and put a new clean diaper on a baby. In a sentence, I had hoped that I'd never have to change a diaper in my life. Put on a bib. The next expression is to put on a bib. So a bib is any is like a protective uh, cloth that goes right here. So at, actually at some restaurants, even for adults, like um, where there's a, like a lot of oil or even like rib restaurants, I think sometimes they'll give you like customers a bib. But for babies who are very messy eaters, uh, you can put a bib on the baby to protect the baby's clothes while they eat. So in a sentence, put on his bib and give him some mashed carrots. Change clothes. The next expression is change clothes. Again, of course, you can use this for yourself or, or for adults. This is not an on, a baby-only phrase. This is not a baby-only phrase. Uh, so to change clothes, uh, if the baby's clothes are dirty or it's just time to, I don't know, you just need to change the baby's clothes, you can say, uh, let's see, like, let's change the baby's clothes. <laughs> That's all. Uh, so in a sentence, after her accident, she had to change her clothes. That's a weird out of context sentence. <laughs> Sing a lullaby. Ah, the next expression is sing a lullaby. Sing a lullaby. Lullaby is a song that is especially to help a child go to sleep. So they're usually really like quiet, soft songs. They have like a nice, like soothing sound to them. So singing a lullaby is like a classic way to calm uh, an upset child down. Uh, so, for example, let's see, when I was little, my mother used to sing me a lullaby before going to sleep. That's true. She sang me Edelweiss from The Sound of Music. My mom used to sing me lullabies that she'd made up on the spot. That's, that, if I ever become a mom, that's going to be me. Like, I'm just making up the lullaby. I'm going to be like, 
go to sleep. I'm really tired. I hope you go to sleep now. <laughs> I think you should. The first expression is I think you should blah blah blah. I think you should is a very neutral, not so strong, not so weak way to give advice. I think you should get a different haircut. I think you should find a new job. I think you should give me all your money. <laughs> well, can't hurt. I think you should is a very typical、uh, way to give advice, or just I think is okay, or you should is okay too. In this sentence, I think you should find a new apartment. Why don't you? The second expression is why don't you blah blah blah. So、uh, it uses the negative. Why don't you? So that means it's a bit softer. It's a bit more of a weak way to give advice. So why don't you、uh, take a day off? Or why don't you help me with my homework? <laughs>、uh, that's sort of a sneaky way to give advice and ask for help at the same time. Why don't you?、Um, I don't know. Find a new hobby, for example. So these are kind of、uh, weak ways to give advice. In this sentence, why don't you get a pet? Have you thought about? Have you thought about blah blah blah? So have you thought about? It sounds it's you're giving your advice, but this is a question for the listener. So have you thought about blah blah blah? It's sound you're you're sharing your opinion, but. You're kind of making it sound like、uh, maybe it was the listener's idea, or maybe the listener has thought of this thing before. So this is also a fairly soft way to give advice. So, like, have you thought about going to a different city? Have you thought about moving in with your friends? Something like that. So these these are probably going to be. Um, questions that are a little bit more serious. Like I don't feel like we would use this for really casual or really light questions, but maybe for something a little more serious and a soft way to give advice. In this sentence,、uh, have you thought about looking for a new job? I don't know if is a good idea. So this is、um, kind of a negative way to give advice or to share your opinion. It's I don't know if blah 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 is a good idea. So、um, you're you're giving someone advice not to do something. So for example, I don't know if getting a pet is a good idea, or I don't know if starting a new project is a good idea. These are different ways that you can say、uh, you don't think. Uh, or you think that the other person should not do something, but this is a soft way to express it. In this sentence, I don't know if taking a year off work is a good idea. Maybe you should try. The next one is a suggestion to try something. So this is a soft but kind of encouraging expression. Maybe you should try blah blah blah. Maybe you should try blah blah. So、uh, you are encouraging someone to. Attempt something to try something.、Uh, maybe not forever, but just for a short period of time. So maybe you should try volleyball. Maybe you should try playing sports. Maybe you should try、uh, spicy food. Maybe you should try something. So it's encouragement to do something new. This is kind of positive, but it's a fairly soft way to give your advice. Here,、uh, maybe you should try studying a new skill. A table for three, please. A table for three, please. You tell them the number of people that you are total, so that the host can bring you to an appropriate table. A table for two, please. A table for five, please. Could I please see a menu? Could I please see a menu? Usually, menus are given to you as soon as you sit down at your table. But if that's not the case and you need to ask, this is a polite way to do it. Could I please see a menu? I'd like to try this dish. I'd like to try this dish. When looking at a menu, hopefully you'll find something you want to eat. I'd like to try this dish. Could you leave out the onions? Could you leave out the onions? If there's an ingredient in the dish that you're ordering that you don't want, you can always ask the waiter if it could be prepared without that ingredient. So, for example, I might say, "Could I get the burger but with no cheese? Could you pass the salt?" Could you pass the salt? When you're at a restaurant, especially if you're at a big table with a lot of people, you might not always be able to reach things. So you would ask, 
Could you pass me the salt? Could you pass me the ketchup? Could you pass me another napkin? Sing along to a favorite song. All right, so the first tip for improving your pronunciation is to sing along to a favorite song. So if you, uh, I should add though, this favorite song should be in your target language. So if you're studying English, pick a favorite English song and sing along to that song. Uh, or try to sing to the song just from memory too. So singing along to your favorite song can help you with pronunciation, can help you with the rhythm sometimes of uh, the language you're trying to learn. So it can be really fun and it can be a good way to practice your pronunciation. In a sentence, I like singing along to my favorite songs. Read out loud. The next tip for your pronunciation is to read out loud. So uh, reading out loud, you can choose something that's interesting for you in, your, in English, if English is the language you're studying. So pick something, maybe it's a news article or maybe it's a book uh, you're interested in. Maybe there's an author you're interested in. Find something in your target language in English and try reading it out loud. So don't just read in your mind, uh, but read the words out loud, speak them so that you can get comfortable pronouncing those words. Uh, and you can try reading uh, the same passage or the same sentence multiple times to make it smoother. Uh, so this can be a really good tip um, for, and it, it, I think it also improves uh, your natural uh, ability to pick up grammar too because if you're reading something like in a book for example you can kind of pick up the natural rhythm of grammar and you also slowly get a feeling for the correct ways um, that words should connect together so this I think is a really good tip in a sentence I sometimes read out loud to practice pronunciation that's true repeat lines you hear in TV shows. The next tip is to repeat lines you hear or the words you hear in TV shows or movies, things like that. So um, this means not only words, don't only repeat single vocabulary words. Yes, maybe you find a vocabulary word that is really interesting um, or it sounds funny or something like that, but by repeating uh, a full sentence or a full line, in a TV show or in a movie, you're putting the words together. So not just one word, but making a whole sentence. So feeling kind of the flow of your language that you're studying. Um, so this can be a better way to actually practice making sentences and repeating sentences instead of just words. So you can repeat after characters in TV shows. I sometimes do this when I'm like watching Japanese TV. I'm like, ah, and then I try and spit it back out. It's hard to do sometimes when it's like the first time you've heard a word or the first time you've heard a grammar point, um, but you can still understand that sentence. It's interesting, so try to say it. Uh, it's kind of fun, actually, I think. In a sentence, try repeating lines from TV shows to practice. Practice speaking in phrases, not single vocabulary words. The next tip, this is very similar to my TV show tip, is to practice speaking in phrases, not in vocabulary words, not just single vocabulary words. Even if you're not repeating lines from TV shows, when you practice speaking, don't just speak in nouns. So sometimes, for example, uh, I'll hear people just use noun, like they'll use a noun and maybe a verb, uh, like I, tomorrow, beach, something like that. And yes, we can probably guess based on that how like the, the meaning, the speaker's meaning, but uh, you need to practice making a whole sentence. So yes, you know those words, I, tomorrow, and beach, and the listener can probably guess what you mean, but you need to practice all those little words in the middle, like uh, like, I'm going to the beach tomorrow. So make a full sentence. Practice making full sentences. Don't only practice single vocabulary words. Make the whole line. It's really good. Sometimes I think my students get irritated. Like, they'll, I, like, I force them to practice full sentences. Like, so I'll say, like, uh, mm, have you ever been to Germany? And they'll say, yes. I'm like, Okay, for the purposes of practice, <laughs> can you make a full sentence? And they'll say, I have been to Germany. Mm -hmm. Like, that's an extreme example, but like, I try to push that, you know, making the full sentence. It's, it's silly sometimes, but just trying to do that. <laughs> okay, uh, so in a sentence, speaking in entire phrases is helpful for practicing the rhythm of a new language. Speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. 
Onwards. Okay, so the next tip is to speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. So this is kind of two tips in one. One, speak with your teacher.、Uh, so if you have a teacher.、Um, Make sure you're speaking in their class. If you, if, if wherever possible. Sometimes I'll have students join my class and maybe they feel shy or whatever,、um, and they don't speak very much. But please speak with your teacher so that your teacher can correct you. Your teacher can give you, at least if they're a native speaker, or maybe even if they aren't a native speaker, your teacher can give you corrections. Uh, and if you don't speak, your teacher cannot help you in most cases. So please speak with your teacher. And if you like, you can tell them, please be strict about my pronunciation.、Uh, so sometimes people will say, please help me with my pronunciation specifically. And then I can stop them every time they make a mistake and we practice that sound,、uh, especially th sounds like the th, like using,、um, Using your mouth a little bit differently can be really uncomfortable for some people, but、uh, if your teacher can point out those things like th sounds, the, this, that, these, those, those th sounds, ending er sounds,、um, practicing those with your teacher can be a really good way to work on your pronunciation.、Mm. So, in a sentence, speak a lot with your teacher, they can correct you and help you improve. Concert. The first word for talking about music is concert. Concert is a live show. Concert is, yeah, the performance is happening in front of your eyes. So,、uh, concerts are really popular worldwide, I think. Depending on where you live, you might hear them called live shows, but usually、uh, in American English, we just say concert, a concert. So, in a sentence, I'm going to a concert this weekend. To see in concert. The next expression is the verb we use for a live show. So the next expression is to see in a concert or to see in concert. So we use、uh, the artist's name along with this phrase. So for example, I'm going to see Coldplay in concert. <laughs> I'm going to see Adele in concert.、Uh, so you use I'm going to see Artist name in concert or、um, in a concert. What did I just say? In concert or in a concert. Both are okay. So, in a different sentence, I'm going to see my favorite band in concert, meaning live. Who do I want to see in concert? I want to see Michael Jackson in concert. <sighs> yeah, I would have loved to see him in concert. He's my favorite. To listen to music, to listen to artist. The next word or the next phrase is to listen to plus music or to listen to an artist. So you can use、uh, this verb with、uh, the type of music or with the specific artist or band or group that you like. So I like to listen to rock music. I like to listen to、uh, pop music, whatever.、Uh, another sentence is I like listening to Beyonce. I like, yeah, so you can use to listen to. Or listening to. Both are fine here. I like listening to funk. It's fine. I like listening to funky artists. It's fine. I like listening to Queens of the Stone Age. It's fine. All of these are great. Who do you listen to? I listen to lots of things. To write a song, to write music. The next expression is to write a song or to write music. So, if you want to make music yourself, you can say write a song, which just means one song,、uh, maybe three or four minutes usually、uh, in popular music, or to write music in general. So,、um, you can use both of these expressions. Song is more specific, music is more general. So, in a sentence, my friend started writing songs recently. Or in a different sentence, writing music is really fun. Track. The next expression is Track, track. So we can use song, yes. But for example, when you look at a, an album,、uh, like on iTunes or maybe like a CD, for example, each,、uh, each song is assigned a number. That's the track number. So we can say,、uh, I like track number three or track three. We use track to talk about a song. So you can say, This is a good song or This is a good track. Both are okay to use. Song and track are both fine.、Um, so, in a sentence, I really like that track from his album. Happy. The first word is happy.
as you might have guessed, happy. Happy is a happy word. When you feel good, when you feel positive, when you are excited, you can say, I'm happy. I was so happy to see my friend the other day. What makes me happy? Food. I'm happy right now. Energetic. Energetic. When you feel happy, perhaps you also feel energetic. You have that sort of Ooh, like uplifting feeling. This chair is squeaking every time I move up. <laughs> I don't really describe my friends or pe people as energetic. I might say a dog or a cat is energetic. Like, wow, your dog is so energetic. What is she doing? She's running everywhere. Is she okay? Maybe I would say about myself, I'm very energetic today if I've had a lot of coffee, like now. Lonely. The next word is lonely. Lonely. I don't want to talk about this word. It's sad. <laughs> Maybe you've been spending a lot of time alone or there's someone that you really want to see or you want to see your family members or maybe you're working too much. I don't know. Whatever it is, maybe you're, you just, you feel like you want to talk to people or you want to see people, be around people, but you can't. Uh, you can use the word lonely to describe that feeling. I, I've only been working for the last few months. I haven't had a chance to spend much time with my friends. I'm feeling kind of lonely. Nervous. The next word is nervous. Nervous is used for any um, tension, any anxiety. Excited, but in a bad way about something. When I was a child, before my piano performances, I would get so nervous. I would be so nervous, my hands would start to shake and then I couldn't play the piece I'd been practicing for months. That's why this is great, because you're not here. <laughs> Forgive me, don't be disappointed in me. Upset. Upset is a really, really useful word. Anytime you feel sad, angry, uh, depressed, disappointed, unhappy in general, you can say, I'm upset, or he or she is upset. It's just a general unhappy word, but it doesn't mean unhappy. It just means something is wrong. There's a way a person usually behaves, but I'm upset means something's not right. In a sentence, I might say, I'm really upset about my performance last year. I was too nervous, and my parents were disappointed in me. I'm sad now. Whoa! Yeah, okay. Equation. The next math word is equation, equation. So uh, up until now, we've been talking about a part of an equation, but the whole math problem, uh, everything there uh, is called the equation. So the process that you need to do in order to solve uh, an equation. An equation is something that you do to solve a problem. This, this part is the equation, this part is the solution. Uh, the, the ending, the result, is the, is the solution. The problem is called the equation, the process, the math process you do to find a solution. Percent. Percent. This is ver a very useful word you can use, uh, of course, when doing math or math problems. Um, but you can also use this uh, when shopping, for example. So a sale is 5% off. 10% uh, off, it represents a discount. You can also use percent to describe um, effort levels. For example, a sports team, uh, a coach might tell his team, I need you to work at 100% today. So it, it's used to express the level of something, um, but it can also be used uh, in sales and in math related terms. NPC. NPC means non-playable character. There are other characters within the game that move the story forward, but that you cannot play as. You cannot become that character, but you interact with them. I have to talk to an NPC in order to move this quest forward. Next is camper. A camper is someone who is waiting for a creature to spawn. So a person who's waiting for the monster to appear is called a camper. You can use camping as a verb too to talk about that like i'm camping this monster really people camp other players i suppose so depending on the kind of game you're playing mmo is a massively multiplayer online game it means you can play online with a lot of different people essentially the next word is sister a female sibling is your sister you can also use sister for a female person that you feel very very close with so i might call my female friend who's i'm very close to my sister my brother likes to shorten it to sis. You might also hear sista as well, if you are silly. Sister. Whoopi Goldberg was in a famous movie called Sister Act. The next word is brother. Brother is a male sibling. Uh, you can also use brother to refer to a close male friend. Common variations of brother are brother, bro, bra, 
brosy, broski. Depending on what kind of person you are, you can choose to use any number of those. Like, I might sarcastically say to my friend, cool story, bro, <laughs> like, if he's told me a story that's not very exciting. In Mario, for example, the name of the Mario games is actually Super Mario Brothers, but Brothers is abbreviated as B-R-O-S, Super Mario Bros. Yeah, just be careful about your use of bro, because it, it sounds a little bit like a college-age boy. Uh, that's kind of, the, kind of the feeling of the word bro. Oh, brother, where art thou? <laughs> Sandcastle. The next word is sandcastles. Sandcastles are usually kids make them. They use like buckets. So kids will like put sand in a bucket or like they move sand into piles and design castles or these really complicated mazes or something. They make things, make buildings out of sand. We call those sandcastles. Um, so in a sentence, my brother and I used to make sandcastles on the beach when we were kids. That's true. In this sentence, get the buckets and we'll make a sand castle. Cooler. So cooler is a noun in this case. Cooler is the place you keep your drinks and your food. It's a, it, it looks like a suitcase, but it has a special lining inside that keeps cold things cold. So you can put ice inside and it will keep your food and drinks cold while you are at the beach in the hot weather. So in a sentence, uh, did you put a bunch of beers in the cooler? I forgot ice for the cooler. The next word is small. Small, smaller, smallest. Small and little are extremely similar. I would pretty much use them in the same way. Uh, however, we don't say when I was a small kid. We say when I was a little kid. Or you can say when I was small. The next word is large. Large and big are very much the same. I will say though that large is used on clothing sizes. Big is not. When we talked about big, we talked about how big can be used to refer to something that's very popular. Large is not used to refer to something that's, that's popular. Large is used um, for, for sizing, I feel, only. So like a house can be large, but it's, it's used to refer to like the physical size of something. Uh, large and in charge. Large, larger, largest. This is the largest uh, and the bottom is in the zoo. <laughs> I have to go. Daughter. Daughter. A daughter is a female child. I wonder if I will ever have a daughter. Brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. So we use in-law to mean our married partner's family members. Uh, not my brother, but my partner's brother. In-law is used after any family member's position or family member's title. Uh, to show they, they belong to my partner's family originally. But now they're part of my, my extended family as well. Uh, I'm going out for drinks with my brother-in-law tomorrow night. Father-in-law. Father-in-law. So we have in-law here, meaning uh, my partner's father. So my father-in-law is very kind. The next word is work. Be careful about using work as a noun and work as a verb. Your work refers to your job, your responsibilities, your tasks at your office or your workplace. You can use it in a phrase like, I have a lot of work to do, or please help me with my work. I like to go to work. <laughs> it can be used to just refer to anything artistic in general. So it can mean, it can be a painting, it can be a building, it can be a sculpture, it can be, I don't know, whatever. Anything artsy can be referred to as work, as in, I really like that new work by that artist, or did you see so-and-so's new work? Twerk? The next word is week. Uh, week refers to the seven-day period that we have decided is one week here in the modern world. Commonly used in expressions relating to your activities, as in, I go to the gym once a week, or I see my friends twice a week, or I have to work every day of the week. Monday through Friday is referred to as uh, weekdays. Saturday and Sunday, weekend. Next word is month. Month is, um, there are 12 months in a year. My favorite month, depending on which country I'm in, I generally like uh, autumn months, like uh, October. I think I usually like the month of October. September, October is good because it's not too hot, not too cold, and Halloween is coming, and that's my favorite holiday. Hannah month, Tana. Try, oh my gosh, try is the next word. Oh, I'm trying my best. <laughs> I try every day to work very hard. Have you ever tried ramen? I tried ramen yesterday and it was really good. Do you try to exercise every day? I'm trying to sleep. Go away. The next verb is leave. Leave. Leave me alone. Leave your doors unlocked. Don't leave your doors unlocked. I have never left a hot air balloon without first taking a picture. <laughs>
And the next verb is call. Call is the next verb. Give me a call. Please call me later. Call me maybe. Call your mom on her birthday every year. She'll be happy. Call, call. <laughs> if you're a seagull, have you ever called the wrong number? Have you ever called a dog by another dog's name? Clothing. Clothing. Cloud. Cloud. Beard. Beard. Beautiful. Beautiful. Bed. Bed. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Cut it out. The next phrase is cut it out. Now, this is usually what a parent would say to a child when they want them to stop doing something. Stop it, in other words. Cut it out. Really, it's any situation that you want to have stopped now. Let's say my friend likes to click her pen all the time, and I'm getting really annoyed. I would turn to her and say, Cut it out, Michelle. I'm upset. The next phrase is, I'm upset. Upset here means not happy, angry, frustrated. I'm upset. You can say this in many different ways. The intonation is important. If you're trying to remain calm, what's wrong? Becky, I'm upset. I mean, I'm, I'm really upset, but I'm not going to show you. Or you can really just yell this, like, I'm upset with you. I'm upset. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? So you say this to someone when you feel that they're being way too proud, maybe way too selfish. They think they're number one. They've done something and you can't believe they were so bold as to do that. Like, who do you think you are, Superman? You can't run that marathon tomorrow with no training. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, the president of the universe? Watch your mouth, watch your mouth. We say this when someone is using bad language or language we think is too strong for the situation. A lot of parents will say this to their kids or a lot of you know people fighting in a relationship might say that to each other. So I'm not going to use the language here, but if I said something very strong, very rude, my mom or my friend might say, hey, hey, watch your mouth. Be careful about what you say. You're not listening to me. The next phrase is, you're not listening to me. Pretty clear, right? Yeah. You're not listening to me. Let me say it again. I don't want to go or something like that. You're not listening to me is used when we're getting angry because we really don't think that person is listening to us. So we say, hey, you're not listening to me. I've been saying it many times, but you're, you're not listening to me. Let me say it again. I want a raise. Let's stay together. Loving you whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. Al Green, from Let's Stay Together. Our first amazing love quote is from Al Green, from his song, Let's Stay Together. Now, first I'm going to say it for you, then I'm gonna sing it, okay? Let's stay together, loving you, whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. Now for Al Green, it's very important that you get very, what we call groovy, you gotta get you feel feel the groove and this chorus this it comes from the chorus let's let's stay together loving you whether times are good or bad happy or sad thank you al green that was beautiful al green love it every time nice slow song playing on a friday night with your girlfriend or boyfriend so this quote i love it because it means that Al Green or whoever is singing it to you is going to love you 
no matter if it's good times or bad times, if you're happy or if you're sad. And it kind of reminds me of the classic American wedding vows that we say. We say, I will love you, and this is not exact, but we say, I will love you in sickness or in health till death do we part. I like this song a lot. We should love each other in good times and bad, right? It's not true love if you're just loving in good times, right? I want you there in the bad times too. Bette Midler from Wind Beneath My Wings. Our second amazing love quote is, you are the wind beneath my wings. We first heard this from Bette Midler in her song, Wind Beneath My Wings. Now, this is a very beautiful song about, it comes from a movie called Beaches that was about two basically best friends. So she's singing this to her best girlfriend and she's saying, you are the wind beneath my wings. In fact, you are the person who gives me this feeling that I can fly and you support me so that I feel like I can fly. So you're the wind kind of beneath my wings. And it's, this line is in the chorus, uh, repeated many times in the song. And uh, it, it goes like this. Did you ever know that you're my hero? You're everything I would like to be. I can fly higher than an eagle. For you are the wind beneath my wings. Something like that. I love that. That movie will make you cry, by the way. Girls, get the tissues ready. Oh, and then the spell was cast. And here we are in heaven. For you are mine at last. Etta James from At Last. Okay, our third amazing love quote is... Etta James, this is from her song, At Last. Oh, and then the spell was cast. And here we are in heaven. For you are mine at last. Now let me talk for a minute about the phrase, the spell was cast. It's kind of like a witch that can cast a spell on you. And so if you have a spell cast on you, it's like you are under this like f this um, command from someone else and you are acting different because they made you do something. But it's like you're so in love with this person that it's like you'll do anything for them. You're under a spell, you know, we might say. And so it's like we're in heaven together. It feels like we're in heaven. I've been waiting so long to be with you. Here we are. Um, you are mine at last. Now, this may not surprise you, but this is a popular wedding song. Um, Etta James sang this, I want to say back in the 1960s, I might have that wrong, but it also became popular from the uh, Beyonce movie a few years ago, where she played Etta James, and Beyonce sang this song as well. This quote is right in the middle of the song, so don't be, don't be surprised when I start very strong here. Here we go. Oh, and then the spell was cast, and here we are in heaven, for you are mine at last. There's a lot of quaver in the voice in that song. Actually, it does come at the end of the song. Sorry, not the, not the middle, but... Beautiful song. Recommend that song at last. Check it out by Etta James. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. Johnny Cash from I Walk the Line. Our next amazing love quote is from Johnny Cash, one of my favorites. The quote is a little difficult, I think, so listen closely. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. The tie that binds means a, like a tie or a connection to someone. You're bound to that person. And Johnny actually wrote this song for his first wife, Vivian, as kind of a promise to her that he would not cheat on her on the road. So by this lyric, uh, he's saying, I keep my eye out 
in case anyone, I keep the ends out here, he says, which is like his eye. I keep the eye, my ends out for any potential connection. I don't want to be connected to anyone else because you're mine. I walk the line. Now, walking the line means like to follow a strict line or path and not go out or away from that line, to follow the rules, basically. Because you're mine, I'm following the rules. I am keeping my eye out in case I make any connections that I'm not hoping or wanting to make. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. Sorry, Johnny had to go high on that one. Johnny did not follow those rules, in fact, when he met his second wife, June Carter Cash, who turned out to be the love of his life. And on the day he met her, he said, you're the woman I'm gonna marry someday. My baby don't care for shows. My baby don't care for clothes. My baby just cares for me. Nina Simone from My Baby Just Cares For Me. Oh my God, I love this song. Oh my God. Oh my God, I love this song. The next amazing love quote is, I'm going to say it's my favorite. I just love this song. It's by one of my favorite singers of all time, Nina Simone. Absolute legend. Wonderful pianist. Okay, here's the quote. My baby don't care for shows. My baby don't care for clothes. My baby just cares for me. Now, maybe by the end there, you realize my baby is not her actual baby. Like, baby, no, no, this is her lover, her love interest. So she's saying, my baby don't care for shows. My baby doesn't care about going to plays or maybe movies. My baby don't care for clothes. My baby doesn't, my lover doesn't care about buying the latest fashion trends. My baby just cares for me. My lover just cares about me. So we don't need anything fancy. We don't have to do anything special. We just need to care and be with each other. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great, it's a great quote. Also notice here the grammar is completely wrong. My baby don't. You should say my baby doesn't. <laughs> but this is for a stylistic flair, if you will. So here is part of this amazing song. Here we go. My baby don't care for shows. My baby don't care for clothes. My baby just cares for me. Oh, where is my piano backup? That song is gorgeous. Please check out the whole song. Phrase number one, I get to check this off my bucket list. In English, we have this phrase, to kick the bucket, which means to die. So to make a bucket list is to make a list of things to do before you die. Now for me, one of mine was to go in a hot air balloon. I had tried to do it for the first time in 2009, but the morning I went, the trip was canceled. So here I am again, uh, more than six years later, and I'm trying again, and this time it was successful. So I get to check it off my bucket list. I get to do this thing before I die. And I did it, English Class 101 listeners. It was so exciting. So you should make a list of things to do before you die, your own bucket list. Phrase number two, will you marry me? So today is actually Valentine's Day and it's very popular on Valentine's Day and anytime you're planning to propose to your special someone to go to a special place. And I can't think of a more special place than in a hot air balloon. There's enough space, trust me, in the basket to kneel down, at least from my country, the USA. It's customary to get down on one knee. It doesn't really matter which knee, at least I've never thought so. And you get down, you kneel on one knee and you say, will you marry me? Now, unfortunately, listeners, I did not see any marriage proposals on my balloon yesterday, but I bet you today, there are over 30 balloons that go off here in Bagan, Myanmar. I bet you someone proposed. Oh, it would have been such a beautiful moment. Will you marry me? That is phrase number two. Phrase number three, this is a first for me. So going in a hot air balloon, as I said, I had never done it before. So it is a first for me. A first being the first time I have done something. I'm sure there are many firsts that you can think of in your life that you've had, and maybe many more firsts that you'd like to have. So this was a first for me, or this is a first for me. Phrase number three. Maybe a first for you could be the first time that you've ever 
had sushi or the first time that you've ever climbed a mountain. I mean, there are so many firsts that you can have. This is a first for me, getting in a hot air balloon. Phrase number four, the view is incredible from up here. Now, this is something that we use in English to say whenever we've gone to the top of an observation tower, the top of a mountain, the top of a temple like I went to this morning, or really any high place that you go to to take a great photo or to get an incredible view. We say, the view is incredible from up here. Phrase number five, what a ride, champagne time. So at the end of my balloon ride yesterday, as soon as we dropped into the field below, we had a beautiful picnic basket unfurled on the field in front of us, and we got to enjoy a glass of champagne to celebrate. And when we finished something, some incredible ride, some maybe could be in a car, on a bus, uh, it could be from a bad experience or a good, but we say, what a ride, what a ride. And when we're about to drink champagne, we say champagne time. This expression from after riding in a hot air balloon originally came from the pilots of these balloons wanting to make sure the farmers in the fields where they landed didn't get too upset. So they would offer the farmers some champagne along with any guests they may have in their balloons. And that's where the tradition first came from. So what a ride, champagne time, phrase number five. How much is it to, how much is it to, how much is it to the airport? You might ask this question to find out how much it costs to take a train or a bus or a taxi to where you need to go. If you get into a taxi, for example, and you ask, how much is it to the airport? The taxi driver will tell you $30. He'll tell you the price you need to pay to get to the airport. If you're taking a train, you might ask the ticket seller, how much is it to the airport? And the ticket seller will tell you the train to the airport costs $10, for example. That way you know how much it costs to go to where you need to be. Does this bus go to? Does this bus go to? Does this bus go to the suburbs? Does this bus go to is a way of asking whether or not the bus that you're looking at has the destination that you need. So you might get on the bus and ask the bus driver, does this bus go to the suburbs, whatever destination? And the bus driver will answer and tell you, yes, get on, or no, you want a different bus. What time is the next bus? What time is the next bus? What time will the next bus arrive? By asking what time is the next bus, you're asking when the bus is going to come to the bus stop or whatever station the bus will stop at. This way, you know what time you need to be at that bus stop. The train is running late. The train is running late. The train is running late again. This is something I say all the time in New York City. The train is running late. If the train is running late, that means you will probably be running late when you get off the train. Where are the ticket machines? Where are the ticket machines? Where are the ticket machines in this station? A ticket machine is a machine that you go to to purchase your tickets. You might see this in any station, whether it's a subway station or a regular train station, or sometimes even a bus station. There will be kiosks that you can go to to enter the information and purchase your ticket. By watching English movies and TV shows and enjoying the feeling when you can understand a word or a sentence. Yeah, I do this too. Uh, when you enjoy something, when you find entertainment value in something like music, movies, TV, and you there's that moment when you pick up or when you understand what your favorite character said, or you understand like a key point in the story, it's a really, really good feeling. It makes you want to continue watching, I think. So that's a really, really nice feeling, I think. And you can do that by enjoying media. Uh, so it's a fun way to learn, and it's a fun feeling to experience. Okay, the next way to motivate yourself is by reading English news articles, blogs, and magazines to get a feel for formal and casual language. So the style that we use here, like in English class uh, 101, and the, 
on the videos on this channel is quite casual most of the time, or at least in these videos it's very casual. But the way that I speak and the way a newspaper is written, the way a magazine is written, the way a, uh, a newscaster presents the information, these are all different ways of communicating. We're using the same language, yes, but they are different styles. So it's important to try to understand those differences uh, and to become familiar with them. So try to find a few different things that you can enjoy. Uh, the next way to motivate yourself is after dinner, uh, you write about your day in a journal in English. Okay, this is an interesting idea. So just take a few minutes after dinner or before you go to bed to write something in English about what you did that day. Or maybe uh, so you have a chance to talk about future tense or to use the future tense, you can use, um, you can talk about your upcoming plans or the things you're going to do the next day. So you can talk about past tense, uh, what you did that day. Um, maybe present tense, how you're feeling as you're writing your journal for the day, and future tense uh, to talk about your upcoming plans. So journaling can be a really effective exercise for motivating you. Okay, the next way to motivate yourself is by practicing with flashcards of useful words and phrases for 15 minutes every day on the train. I actually do do this, I use, uh, but I use an application to study Japanese, to study kanji. And 15 minutes every day adds up over the course of a week. You, you can learn a lot of information in a short period of time. And uh, if you live in the country where um, your target language is spoken, then you might even find the word you studied on the train, you see it like after you leave the train. You might see that word later on in your day. So you can immediately uh, feel like an extra sense of motivation by knowing that this thing you're studying is applicable is something you can use right away. It's a really cool feeling. So this is a tip. I honestly, I use this. Last, uh, I make sure to thank anyone and everyone who corrects my English. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I think this is really important because people are really nice. They don't want to correct you when you make a mistake, but sometimes people do. They're really polite about it and they tell you the more, tell you a more natural way or they give you a suggestion for how to improve your English. Make sure you say thank you, like repeat after them and then say thank you um, so that, you know, it's motivation for them uh, to tell you again in the future, to help you again in the future. So make sure to say thank you to anyone who helps you with your English. Personally, I think that, or I would just use I think that, personally makes it sound a little bit more polite, I think. You can use this to introduce an opinion. For example, personally, I think that pizza is amazing. Personally, I think that dinosaurs would have been delicious. <laughs> personally, I think that cars should be made to enjoy with friends. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna edit there. <laughs> Personally, I think that you shouldn't worry about it. Yes, that's probably a much more useful sentence than dinosaurs would be delicious. <laughs> the next expression is what does blah 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 mean? So where here is the word you don't know. So for example, what does pasta mean? What does stegosaurus mean? So a word like stegosaurus is a really strange word that you probably don't know. Stegosaurus is a type of dinosaur. We're on a very dinosaurs, I don't know, it Jurassic, really we're on a there. Jurassic adventure at the moment. So this is a pattern you use when you don't know, uh, when you don't know the meaning of the word and you would like someone to explain it to you. So if you say, what does stegosaurus mean? Then someone can say, oh, it's a dinosaur. It's kind of like, sh it's a sort of short guy and it has a bunch of spikes on its back and it has a long tail and it gets into a fight with a Tyrannosaurus Rex. If you saw the movie Fantasia by Disney, Okay, <laughs> so in this sentence, what does complication mean? It means problem. Okay, the next pattern you can use is, can you tell me more about blah, blah, blah? So on a topic that you would like more information about, you can say, can you tell me more about the soccer game last week? Can you tell me more about the plan for the party next week? So something you would like more information about, you can say, can you tell me more about this thing? Okay, so in a sentence, can you tell me more about your sandwich options?
that is a useful sentence. Very useful. That is a useful sentence. Okay. In this sentence here, uh, we don't have that back home. Can you tell me more about it? Mm, this is use the reverse pattern. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the next expression is if it were up to me. If it were up to me. Ah, oh, I had to teach this in a class a couple weeks ago, actually. If it were up to me means if I could make the decision. If this was my, if this were my decision. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So meaning if I could make the choice, this is what I would do. But one point here is the nuance is it is not my decision. This is not my decision. But if it were my decision, I would do blah, blah, blah. So, for example, if it were up to me, every day would be Saturday. Woo, 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 but it's not, right? So, um, that's, that's always the underlying, that's always the kind of basic, um, nuance of this phrase. Some, this decision is not mine. Okay. Here the example is, if it were up to me, I would take my boss to dinner. Oh my. <laughs> Things just got scandalous. <laughs> The next pattern is I feel like blah, blah, blah. You can use I feel like when you introduce uh, a suggestion or something that you would like to do, especially for food, drinks, or activities. So, for example, I feel like coffee. I feel like Italian food. I feel like an action movie. There's some activity or something you would like to do at the end of this pattern. I feel like bowling this afternoon. Something needs to go here, some sort of activity. Um, of course, you can use this expression to talk about your feelings. I feel like something, but this something must be a noun. It must be a noun. Like, if you feel really great, I feel like a million bucks, for example. If you feel really bad, I feel like garbage. <laughs> That's a nice expression that somehow just came out of my head. Anyway, um, you can use this in two ways, but this must be completed with a noun phrase at the end of the sentence. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.